So I'm Dan, I'm uh, going to talk about what I've been doing here for the past two years. Uh, so I've been working with Professor Wynn Rampin on his pumpkin energy storage system. Uh, we've also had various help uh, over the years um, because we had, uh, we had a grant sort of expired now, but we had people also working on the project, which was Dr. Rick Jeffries and uh, Mr. Carmen Gibson. So I just want to start off quick, why energy storage? Because I know we've got a various mix of people here, uh, some combustion, some CCS, uh, some not related to either. Um, and I guess uh, the best, the simplest answer to that question is because we want to build more renewables and we want to, uh, we're going to have an, in, there's going to be an inevitable sort of difference between supply and demand. And um, if you have a really good type of energy storage, then you can store your energy when you've got a lot of it and you put it back when there's high demand for it. So another reason to do it is to provide ancillary services. Uh, these are things like frequency support and voltage control that are traditionally now provided by gas and coal and if we were to phase out those there would need to be some replacement. Now this is actually one particular thing that batteries are starting to come on and do in the energy storage phase now is ancillary services but it's just another benefit you get out of them. Um, another interesting thing to do with it is you can sort of benefit site installation. So a good example of this is if you want to install a gigawatt wind farm somewhere where you don't really have a very good grid connection. Say your grid connection is limited to 500 megawatts, then maybe, you, so you can't build a gigawatt wind farm there because if the wind was to blow really hard, you couldn't export it all. But if you could put some localized energy storage in there, you could perhaps make use of that line a lot more. And you install more turbines and you have grid capacity, but you don't really produce that much energy most of the time, so you store it a lot of the times and you can export it. Um, you can export it when, when, when you can. Um, so today, it's about 7% of the average grid power is from those four pumped hydro stations right there. Uh, and you can see, sort of looking right at them, that they're not really near major population centers or anything. So various studies, and this, this wasn't really part of my project, we sort of just did a bit of literature search on it. We said, right, at today's market prices, easily three gigawatts um, of capacity at six hours of storage could be justified. And that's taking today's prices, which don't, there's no real good government incentive in the UK at least for installing energy storage today. So that paints a semi-optimistic picture for where we want to do it, because if there was actually good government incentives, uh, I think that number would increase quite a bit. So why do we think our technology is good? Uh, well, short answer is it's, we think we can be similar with the existing uh, standard, which is essentially pumped hydro, in good ways and dissimilar with it in some other good ways. So uh, what that means is roughly a 70% round trip efficiency. That's AC, AC efficiency, including your inverters, including your, your grid, all, all that stuff. Uh, similar ramp up and down time, uh, similar ability to provide ancillary services, and similar, ultimately similar storage size. Um, but again, with the size, I think there's also some advantages in its dissimilarity and that ideal air system would be quite scalable. So if you, want to buy, if you want to build a pumped hydro station today, you've got to raise a ton of money and essentially have to make it big enough to get down your pounds per kilowatt hour and pounds per kilowatt metric. Um, so we think that maybe if you make something that's quite scalable, you can build it at smaller scales with less money to begin with and then make it bigger as, as you need to. So another thing on there is the geographical independence. Because you need the very specific ge um, geography to be able to build pumped hydro, uh, it's quite remote. I mean, sort of the north part of Wales there is not very many people at all, and same thing with the highlands. Um, and there might be some upgrades, some operating on these in the near future, uh, but fundamentally, in the nice, flat, highly populated areas, you don't have large amounts of storage. So if you could build something that maybe you put on the outskirts of London or Edinburgh, uh, it could provide a lot more services immediately to the grid, in, in theory. So. What are we proposing to build? Well, basically, it's uh, a closed Joule Brayton cycle uh, heat pump slash heat engine. So when you want to store energy, you run it as a heat pump. And when you want to generate electricity, you run it as a heat engine. So what it looks like is sort of a classic compressor expander and uh, two heat exchangers in the, in the inside. So basic idea is you've got nitrogen or argon as your working gas, which is being compressed and expanded. And then depending if you're on the hot side or on the cold side, you take it out with some fluid. So what it looks like in practice is you've got, you've got a loop that's going around. So if you've got a compressor over there, it compresses the gas from, say, a mid-pressure of 20 bar, compresses it up with, a, say, 200 bar. It gets quite hot doing that, 
you extract the heat, you put it in the thermal store. So now you've got high pressure gas, which is now at um, some sort of mid temperature, maybe 30 C, which you can then expand down to quite a cold temperature, maybe negative 100. Uh, and then you extract that cold or cooled, put it in another thermal store, and now you're back where you started, and you can press again. So the idea is you just run the cycle over and over and over again, and your stores get more and more full as you do this. Um, when you need energy, when you need to generate it, you basically switch the compressor and the expander. So you switch the direction. I mean, these are illustrated as turbo machinery. Here you would sort of switch the direction. It's not that easy, um, but essentially now you're, you're running the whole thing in reverse. You're taking your, your cold stuff, you're compressing it back up to a mid temperature, you're injecting your heat, you expand it back down again, and you go electricity back. Now, so what it looks like in practice is a lot more complicated. Um, these are like this, this would be sort of turbo machinery type things. Uh, you might see it in a, like a steam turbine or something. What we found is that the efficiencies for these type of turbines just wasn't where we needed them to be. So the working concept now is Maybe it looks a bit Victorian to some people, but essentially it's a, it's a large piston compressor. Uh, and the reasons for that is we really need to keep the efficiency quite high on this to get that 70% ratchet efficiency number. So this is a working concept. You can see we still have the hot and cold stores there. Uh, you've got the compressor and expander here, and there's some heat exchangers involved. So the grid basically comes in right here from your electric motor generator. It drives some very controllable uh, hydraulics, which then drive these piston uh, compressors back and forth. So what have we done? Um, oh, yeah, those picture of sort of the loops again that you get. Um, what have we done? Well, we built a real-time simulation of the whole thing. This was sort of based on first principles in MATLAB, looking at how would this thing actually operate. And we sort of took it from the point, we didn't model the grid interactions, but we said, right, if we have an electric motor generator, how do we make these pistons go back and forth? And what sort of heat transfer do we get inside these compressors, and how do we transfer the heat into the heat stores? Excuse me. Uh, so it's all done out quite in depth. Um, and we also built a separate model for the thermal stores. So that took a long time. Um, and we learned some very interesting things out of it, but what we had to sort of do is get to a point and say, right, we've got a model, but where are we least confident in it? Where are the parameters that uh, could be one, could be 100, and the literature doesn't really tell us where it's meant to be and we have no idea. Or even the literature tells us it's this, but it's in a similar type environment, and we're not quite sure, and we need to be confident that this thing's actually going to work. So, um, yes, just said. So basically, our biggest uncertainties is inside these piston compressors right now, because it's working at quite high pressures, quite high temperatures, and uh, we just really don't have a good idea from simulations today or what we've seen, what exactly is going on in there. So. Part of my job was to build an experimental <coughs> model to validate some of this stuff. But before I talk about that, I want to just go in a bit more detail about compression in general. Um, so like I said, uh, so 20 bar was our lower temperature, 200 bar was our top temperature, it's a pressure, rate, pressure ratio of 10, and we need to keep that quite high. We need to sort of have a pressure ratio be 8 or above, I think, uh, just because we need to get a certain amount of power out of this rig. Um, but the problem with that is we have fluid limits because it's using real fluids and they will boil at certain temperatures and they'll freeze at certain temperatures. So in order to get that pressure ratio with the fluids we want and the gases we want, uh, we're having some temperature problems. So if you imagine we've got a cylinder here that we're going to compress. Um, if we compress it isothermally, so essentially there's a perfect heat sink on the outside of that compressor, we, we extract all the heat perfectly. Uh, you can double the pressure, have the volume, it's the same temperature. Obviously, we don't want that because we're storing energy as heat and we need a temperature difference. Um, so the opposite of isothermal is isentropic or uh, reversible adiabatic, either one. And what you do there is you just compress the gas. It's perfectly insulated cylinder. No heat escapes at all. And you get some high pressure, some high temperature, and half the volume. Now, this didn't work for us because it was going to get us to too high temperatures for what we wanted. So we said, well, is there a middle ground? And there is. It's uh, called polytropic compression, and you basically modify the properties of the fluid to get the end temperatures you want, still having the right pressures. And as you can see in the equations here, there's, sort of, there's this value here, gamma, which describes the properties of the gas. So that's the ratio of specific heat, um, constant pressure to constant, constant volume in the gas. In the polytropic compression, what we figured out, we said, well, if we, want, if we need to do this compression, if we mix in some liquid in the compressor, we can modify the properties of that gas, I guess it's more a mixture now, and we can get out what we want. 
So if we put it on a PV diagram, you sort of see isothermal on the left there. You, you compress, you get some output pressure. Uh, if you do it isentropically, you get some other one. Polytropic is somewhere in the middle. And the reason why I put that squiggly orange line on there is to just say that uh, when you're trying to mix a fluid, you, you got to make sure it's quite well mixed. Otherwise, you're not going to get a predictable pressure curve. You're not going to get a predictable compression, and you're not going to get a good result. So my whole task was to build a rig which tested our method of mixing gases and liquids while you're compressing up to quite high temperature, which is not necessarily something that's been done before. Um, so what did I do? Um, uh, we built this test rig, um, and basically how it works is there's a hydraulic cylinder down here. Uh, there's a big power pack that sits on there now, and that drives via this ram, drives this compressor backwards and forwards, and we've got our mixing device in there. Um, so built it, tested it. Uh, you know, it's, one of these, it's one of these things where it was a really good learning experience for me because you, you think you're building one thing and then there's all sorts of problems running in the way and it's, it's a very good learning experience. But uh, ultimately we wanted, to get, we wanted to get pressure volume curves that showed us getting the right temperatures and the right pressures. Now mixing, uh, determining how well something is mixed is quite difficult to do in experimental work. Um, uh, the main way of doing it is you sort of have an ultrasonic uh, probe that measures the speed of sound in your mixture and then you can from there work out what the different components are. Now we've got a big metal mixing device and they're spinning around quite fast so ultrasonic just is, is a non-starter for us. Um, we sort of said well you can pretty much figure out how well it's doing by just looking at the pressure and uh, the temperature. So that's what we did. We, we're, not directly we're not directly measuring that mixing amount. Um, so what I've done with it is sort of ran it uh, adiabatically first with no liquid in there to get some good PV curves out of it, um, tested how reversible the PV curve was it, and then looked at different amounts of liquid and, uh, and gas in there and seen how well things have compressed. And um, oh, and I also did some high, high speed camera work for it which was really cool and it was quite fun and uh, my supervisor said I'm allowed to show it off because there's potentially some IP concerns with some of this stuff because we're sort of trying to get a new grant now which might involve with a company so if that doesn't go through I can show you guys a lot of cool pictures next time but it depends if it happens or not so uh, I was disappointed in that that's the way it is. Um, so some results out of this, uh, this is sort of just my uh, MATLAB output for it as you can sort of see this is a uh, this essentially this is multiple compression and expansion strokes back and forth. So this is expansion of compression. So you can see sort of you could trace it up, it's compressed up to about three bar, and then it comes back down here. And this was sort of some of the first outputs I got, and it was quite interesting because I was thinking, well, I'm reaching the same pressure each time, but for some reason the curve is shifting to the right. So how am I getting more volume for the same pressure and everything like that? And it's sort of well illustrated on this, which sort of shows you the beginning and final position of each stroke and basically I'll, uh, you know two part of this troubleshooting you just figure out that right I've got a big leak in it because essentially it has to go further and further each time to reach the target pressure um, which means there's a leak uh, and it always comes back to the same position each time which means essentially I'm starting to pull a vacuum on it. So uh, this sort of interesting troubleshooting that you have to do with this type of experimental work. Um, so that's fundamentally what I've been up to. Uh, there's a lot more to be done. Uh, uh, in this picture here, there's a acrylic cylinder on it, so we can only do that at about three bar. Uh, we've got a big old metal cylinder which takes up to ten bar. Uh, I've got to put that on soon and get some good results out of that. Um, but what we're seeing is we're going to have the ability to sort of validate our models going into this, and it should be some good results. So uh, that's all I've got for now. I'm sure uh, IES seminars will get me out here soon enough to tell more about it. That's all I have. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.